Hi, my name is Linda Amen, and I'm a professional watercolorist. And I teach a lot of classes, and one of the things that I have continually come up is how to stretch watercolor paper. And after we do it in class, people forget the different steps. So this is to help you out. Um, I want to talk about some of the different materials. I always feel it's important to get the best materials. It will make a difference in your product. Even when I teach at um, a grade school, we use the finest of paper because first grade and up, it makes a difference on what the product is. So for certainly for us, that's going to make a difference. Um, this is an Arches 140 cold press paper. And I use either Windsor Newton or Arches brand. They are both very good. I stay away from any of the brands that would be a type of a tear-off sheet. Um, they will not work the same. It will say maybe the same 140, but it is not going to work the same. So always make sure that you get the, the higher quality item. Then the other things we're going to have here is um, a T-square, and you can use a regular ruler if you want, a natural sponge, an eraser. This is the gummed watercolor tape. Um, we've got some X-Acto knives here, a pencil, ruler, scissors, popsicle stick, and drafting tape. So that's pretty much what we're going to be using for what we do. The 140 paper, the way they come up with the number is they take 500 sheets and they drop them down onto a scale and the weight is 140 pounds and that's what the weight number would be called, 140 cold press paper. This is, you can tell it's a lot heavier, what they do with this is they take 500 sheets again, drop it on the scale and it weighs 300 pounds. So this is called 300 pound paper. Most of the time people will not stretch the 300 because it will actually hold up without buckling and everything on its own. Um, for various reasons I still prefer to stretch the paper because it changes it. Um, something I say in class is one thing changes everything. So if you stretch it or use it unstretched or you use a different brush, you use a different watercolor brand, all those things changes the product. So with that, we're going to use the 140 cold press watercolor paper. This one is Arches. And you can always tell the top side because there's a little tiny imprint here. And that's the, the top side, what is the proper side. On this particular paper, I use either side and it works well tiny bit of difference, but a lot of times I don't want this symbol to actually show up in my painting. It's proper that you can do that, it's just I prefer not to put the advertising of the, the brand in the corner of one of my paintings. The way that you um, cut paper is really fun. Um, I take and use a popsicle stick or, you know, craft stick, and if you take it with most of your papers, there's some of the papers that are very soft, this won't work with. But most of the brands that I use will work. And when you do this, you want to be sure that you don't dig the edge in here because that would scratch your paper. And then later when you go paint across, you're going to see that scratch. So just along this edge, you're hitting on that with your thumb. And then you want to flip it and do it the other side again. And you're just creasing and bending it. I only have to do it a couple times because I've done this a lot, but I would suggest doing it at least three times. Then you hold it up like a little book. Something there. Hold it like a pinched book and touch with your finger and it will tear right up. And it's extremely easy to tear lots of sheets very quickly. If you want to keep track of what side is up before you tear it, you would just put a tiny little X in the corner of each of your sheets so that no matter how many times you tear it down, you know which direction was up. So I'll do that again for you because I want a quarter sheet today. Pinch the top like a little book, put your finger on it, press it, and just press it all the way down on the table. Tear off the end. Okay? Then the next thing we're going to use is a T-square. If you don't have a T-square, you can just use a regular ruler, but I find this is very quick for me. I like using the corner of the table because I can just size up the piece of paper to the corner. This is my X side up, so I know that's the side I wanted. 
And then I'm just going to draw a line. And see, I'm squaring everything up very easily. I'm doing a little bit over a quarter of an inch. If you're doing a full sheet on a board, what you're going to want to do is have a little farther in for your line because it's going to stretch and pull out and you'd want a little more grab area. So you would go a little bit thicker than this line is. So you do that. And then this is the gummed watercolor tape. This is the regular kind. You used to be able to buy it at the post office and all of your office supplies. Now you can only get it in art stores. I go through a lot of it with my students. This is generally the size you get. This is the size I buy because I get it through another mail order company and it gives me, you know, for all my students as well as my own. But this is the size you're generally going to find. Make sure that it is not the um, tape that you get at some of your office stores that has the strings in, in it. Because if you get the strings in it, it's going to be very difficult to use to get it down to hold it as well as to get off your board later. So make sure that you get it at an art store or some place that has just the plane. Then what you're going to do is you're going to use your scissors and you only need to cut it the size of, and if you notice I'm doing all of this before I do anything about wetting paper because it is really wise to have all your materials ready so you're not panicked when you're starting to work on getting the paper actually ready. And then, very important, when you are done cutting your tape, put this far away. I always put it under the table or somewhere else because all you need to do is accidentally set it in a little puddle of water and then you've ruined the whole roll. And how do you think I know that? So, I will put that under the table so it's out of my way. Those are my two shorts and my two longs. I'll set those aside. Now, I'm going to stop just a minute and tell you why we stretch paper. And it's actually not stretching the paper. It doesn't increase in size. What it is, is when you get um, the paper wet across, the fibers will swell up and it will buckle as you work. And when I'm doing some of these large areas, I have enough trouble keeping the, the, the water and the paint going where I want it without having hills of, of um, rolls of the paper to move the paint as well. So that's why I stretch paper. It's going to end up looking like this when I'm done. And then the other thing I found is when I move it from place to place, I'm keeping my painting safe. I'm not tearing it or scratching it or anything because it's on a surface that's, that's really good. It takes a little bit of time to stretch paper, but when I do it, I generally do a number of them at a time, and that way I have them ahead. I do some, this is a quarter sheet of paper, you saw me tear it into fourths, and then I have some boards that are large enough for a half sheet, and then boards that are a full sheet size. And that way I would stretch a number of papers and they would be ready for me to use. So you can, on the 140 paper, as well as the 300, you can paint it straight on this and have no, you know, and not have to stretch it at all. You can just use it like this, but you would, any amounts of water, you get a little bit of um, roll on it. So I just, as I said, prefer to do this. The other thing is, when I cut it off the board, and we'll show you that later in the tape, when I cut it off the board, it's flat and ready to frame. I don't have to flatten it later and work to get wrinkles out. It comes off my board ready to frame. So to me that saves a lot of steps. So we've got that. And then the board we're going to use, there's different kinds. I go to the lumber yard and I get, they keep changing the name on it, but it's basically a Duron or a Masonite board that has been treated on both sides. You don't want it to be the really rough stuff because it's not going to hold as well and it will buckle a little bit more. It, it holds up well. So this is going to be what I'm going to use on this board here. Uh, the other thing that I want to let you know is you can keep, you can buy a system that will keep you from having to stretch the paper. I prefer to stretch my own paper because I can decide what size it is. I can um, keep the cost down a little bit because I don't have uh, an, someone doing it for me. You can buy what are called blocks. They're not the same as a pad where I showed you where you would tear off the paper. 
they actually are um, all fastened in. So this is what I'm working on. And what it is, is it is 20 sheets of paper that are all glued, all stretched together. And then when the painting is entirely done, I would just take a little popsicle stick in, run it around, and pop off the finished painting. These come in all sizes. So you can buy it already done. I find that I don't mind the stretching. It's kind of part of the process that I like to do. And of course, when you have someone do it for you, each one of these sheets comes out to a little bit more cost than if you do it yourself from a large sheet. So these are available in all different sizes. Again, make sure you read that it's the 140 cold press. The brand name is Arches or Windsor Newton. Those are the ones I would suggest that are, that are good. So now we're going to go ahead and stretch the paper or size it. We are basically changing this, this size. So I'm going to go to the sink and we're going to show how to do that. Okay, so when you wet your paper, you can use cold to warm water, but not hot water. I've tried lots of different things and all of those ranges are good. Now you're going to read in books that you need to soak it in the sink or soak it in the bathtub. I don't know about you, but even after you've cleaned your bathtub, there's residue of soap or scouring um, materials in there, and I don't want any residue on my paper. So I don't soak it. I wet it, and I, you'll see how I do this. And I have it been, had it successful for years and years, and my students have it successful as well. So we are going to go this route because it works. So you're just going to run your water, and what you want to do is make sure that everything gets totally wet. So you're going to have to tilt the paper front and back. And a lot of times you'll get these little particles from the board, and that's where all those little things are. So make sure that you're looking that everything is wet. If everything's not wet, you are going to be sorry. Because it's not going to be as successful for you. And I'm not taking a lot of time. I mean, I'm just making sure it's soaked. Because you'll read that you have to soak it for 20 minutes. I've not found that you have to. Then I'm running off the edge. And while I'm running off the edge, I'm getting my sponge ready. And unfortunately, it will take a little practice to know how much water in your sponge. You don't want it soaking wet. You don't want it dry. So it's kind of in the betweenst. So I'm going to get this a little bit more out. Okay. Then, if you take that and lift it to the corner like this, then you're ready to go to your board. Now when you put it on your board, it's going to start buckling right away and just ignore it. Pretend it's not doing that. The other thing that will happen is right now you will go, oh I forgot to draw the lines on the paper. If that happens to you, don't bother with it. Eye it the best you can and get it down because you're going to find that if you stop and do all that, it's just going to be too much. So always try to have everything ready, but if you didn't do your lines, ignore that and just hit it the best you can. See, it's already starting to buckle a little bit. Now I'm going to take, and I always do one side, and then the other side, and then that side, and that side. And it's either, you can go either long or short, but just go opposites. So then what you're going to do is, you're going to take your sponge, and you're going to come across your tape once. If you go over it a number of times, you've taken all the glue off. And the other thing you don't ever want to do is come across your paper. What we had is we had people were um, stretching paper in class, and then they would get all this residue across, and it was glue because they'd come across. But we didn't know until later, and I started watching people and seeing how they were doing it. So just come across, grab one end of it, give yourself a good soaking all the way to the other end. Try to get it once. Pick it up. Lay it down on your line, if you have it. And push really hard. Put some muscle into it. Then take your other long piece, again, off side of the board. Try to hit it once, all the way across. And you can tell it's wet, but it's not juicy, juicy wet, and it's not dry. It's that between we talked about. And push really, really hard again. Put some muscle into it. Look at this. going to drive you nuts. Ignore it. When I do a large sheet of paper, a full sheet, every single time I do a large sheet, I go, it is not possible on earth that it's going to go flat. And then hours later I'll go, it's a miracle, it worked. <laughs> so just, just ignore and just keep going. Because it will go taut, like our little sample over here. Okay, 
Now, there's a couple little steps right here I have found that have made all the difference. First of all, putting the muscle into it. And if you notice, I got the tape down pretty well. If you didn't hit the tape well, then you're going to have all these little bubbles and things under there. So it'll take practice, but just do really take your time, get it really down smooth. Then the next thing is using your popsicle stick. If you'll take and run along like this, if you don't have a popsicle stick, you can use a kitchen knife as long as you're not denting into anything and being too rough. Then here's the other thing I found that really made a difference. Where the paper meets the edge, just take and draw along that edge. And it makes all the difference for how well it will stick. Because you want it to stick well. And then I sometimes encourage it down a little bit on the edges. And then look at the buckling that's starting to take place. That is what I'd rather have not, not have happen when I'm painting. Now, after it's stretched, once in a while, especially on a large sheet, if you have really large amounts of water, even when it's stretched, it will do this a little bit after it's dry. But most of the time, the entire time you're painting, it will stay flat. This will take a number of hours to dry. You do not want to paint on it at this point. You want it to be taut like this, totally dry, and then you'll paint on it. So that's what you want to do with that. So that you'll set this aside, leave it flat. If you leave it up, all the water will run down into this edge and it will loosen this, this section right here. Now I can tell you what happens, um, some of the problems you may come across if it didn't work for you. Number one, too much water on your tape or not enough. Or you tried to hurry the process. If you set this out in the sun or if you hair dryer it, you will pop it off the board. So you can't hurry the process. That's why you do a number of boards, have quite a few ahead, and then that way you've got them for later. Um, when you tear it off, I'm going to show you how you take it off the board later. This is how the board will look. This is a, a larger board. This is a painting in process. And what I do is I like to have these beautiful edges when I'm finished. So when I cut it off, if I have um, a client that wants the painting and they want to frame it themselves, it will have this nice little edge. So on this particular painting, I haven't gone all the way to the edge. I'm just using this amount of paper. And over here, I can do some practice little swatches of color if I want. Now, we are going to pretend for the uh, basis of this video that this is a completely finished painting because I want to show you how to cut off the board. And right now I have some in process and nothing that was at the finish stage. So I want to show you how to take it off. So this would go far away. So we'll just put it under the table. And hours later it would be done. So what you do is you take an X-Acto knife. And I really feel it's important to be safe first. So my X-Acto knives always live in a little envelope. And then always make sure that you tighten it every single time. Because as you work with it a lot, they'll loosen up. And you don't want to be putting a lot of pressure and the blade pops out. The other thing is I don't ever want to accidentally go into my leg with a knife. So again, safety first, I step aside so that when I'm coming down with the, the pressure, any slip would go past me. So on this edge, I'm going to brace myself. It's, it's going to take a little bit of cutting. And you can usually hear when it goes through. And I'm just going to come all the way up to that edge. Now, if it were all the way, you know, the painting was all the way, I'd be in a different section. But on this one, I'm going to do this. Okay, and then I'm going to pull this. And again, we'll pretend this is a masterpiece, all finished, ready to go. Okay, now this is where I'm going to change. See, this I want to keep that edge. Here, I'm going to take off the tape so I can see where it better cut. I needed to keep my way width there. And this is only after the painting is entirely done. And I'm going between the tape and the watercolor paper. Again, positioning myself for safety. It takes a little bit of muscle to get the cut. If you do it and it won't come up, come down the line again. And then I'm going to take it again, position. Okay, it comes off the board. 
And here's why I put that drafting tape around, and I'll talk about the drafting tape. So when I give that painting to someone, it's got all beautiful edges. It almost looks like it's matted. And then the other thing is, whatever I've done for my painting, especially on something I'm, I'm doing with very special edges, like down here, I don't want to lose any of what I painted. So by doing this method, I'm not losing anything because I've left room for the mat and the framing to come up to that line. Then the way you take it off the board, and I always save this for little test things, but you're going to take and just tear it off the board, and I won't take time to tear all that off, but it was taped well, so it's not going to come off easy. So you're going to take, tear, 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 take it all off. It's like a cooking show. Here's the next level. Here's what I got off the last board. Now, I used to get all this off, soak it and make it look beautiful. But then when I would have 30 boards come back from students that we needed to tear off, I decided life was too short for that. So what I do now is, if this were the size, I make sure that whatever piece of paper I put here again fits exactly to where the last one was. I don't ever want the paper to come over this edge because if it comes over this edge, there might be a little stickiness there and then when I take the painting off, it would tear. So what I'm going to do is make sure that it drops the same. And because I use a pretty close to the same size of boards each time, I'll show you this. You can see I would just drop in and, and just drop it in again and, and do it exactly like that. So that's what you do with the boards. And this is a full sheet board. So I would have a full piece of watercolor paper on this. And again, I would come in a little bit farther than the quarter inch when I do the lines because there's going to be a little more stretch and a little more grab there that I want to make sure it doesn't come loose, pop loose. So if we were having this one ready for a painting, the next step I would do is lay down my painting, my, my pattern or whatever I was going to do, how, what size I was going to do, and this is drafting tape. It looks just like masking tape. In my family, we make sure that it never gets to where it's used like regular masking tape because it's more like 450 a roll, sometimes 650 a roll and I want to keep it for, for this. So it's, it's a low tack and what you do is you decide where your painting is going to be painted and you can see why we're doing it. We grab it over the edge just a little bit, put it down really strong and you would do it, you only need it the length of your area and I'm just going to give my whatever edge I want, half and half is kind of what I do with it. You can get in different widths. This works fine for me. And just grab it down. And by the way, if you got it on there slightly crooked, this is where you can straighten it up if you like. If you didn't get your paper down exactly square. The other thing, when you go to frame it, it will end up square somehow, or even. Okay. So that's where I would be ready now to put my painting down and trace off or draw or prepare and do that. Then when I pull all that off, cut it off the board, um, I have these nice edges that I can come up to. I'll get another large one I'm working on just to show you again how that looks like when you're doing, um, how you're setting that up. So this is an example of something that I've got that I'm working on. This is a photograph. And here's where that nice edge will show up when I cut it off the board. So I'm going to cut it off the board right here. And you know, while I'm painting, it holds the space. And then when I pull it all off, it's going to be ready. The other thing you're going to notice is, see how the board's not entirely flat. Um, you can buy a heavier board, and then it, it, when the paper bows up and taunts flat, it won't have that little bit of bend but I don't like carrying a really heavy board. <laughs> so th this works fine. Everything of the paper stays flat. When I cut it off, it's flat, ready to go. But if you get a little bit of bend in your largest sheets, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Otherwise, and like I said, you might want to buy a larger board. Now, I'm going to show you how you actually would um, trace down your picture. This is a photograph. Some of you will recognize this. My students do this one. And so I've just done a tracing to save time. And I'm just using the drafting tape rather than a masking tape because it will lift. It's got that low tack. And you, you place it on your board wherever you want it to be. I've already put the, the um, tape on. 
so I'd say we'd probably put it right about there. And then what I'm going to do for a bonus for you is I've had a lot of you ask for how I make my own carbon paper. You can buy carbon paper and I like what I make and I've used it for years because it is erasable. You can change if it's light or dark and it is, uh, doesn't have a waxy film. Some of them when you buy them, even, even um, sometimes when they say they don't have a waxy film, what happens is you draw it down and then when you put the watercolor across it, it does a little bit of a resist. So if something works you just keep doing it. So that's what I do with this. So I'm going to just show you how well it works and then I'm going to do a demonstration real quick on how to make your carbon paper. And you can use it over and over and then eventually it will wear out and you'll have to make more. So what you're going to do is just take your pattern and draw your lines and then find Find it down here, see if it's dark enough for you. It's good to check right away because what you don't want to do is find out the paper was the wrong way, there's nothing there, and your image is drawn but wonderfully on the back of your sheet. So it's a good idea to do this. And how again do I know that? All of us have done it at least once. So you would draw the whole thing, and if you want to use this pattern over because you decide to draw it again and paint it again and do something with it another time, Rather than using a regular pencil, use a colored pencil the second time, maybe red, and then the third time you use, use a green. That way you can always tell where you've been and you won't have a loss of where your lines are. So here's where those couple places are and you can very easily erase the lines. So it works out really well. So this is the stage. This is a stage that is at for the painting. You can see again it's going to be a wonderful finished edge and that's why I like to stretch and do this whole thing. So I'm going to set this aside and I'm going to show you how to make your carbon paper. I'm going to do something that you would never do and that is I'm doing it in the house. I generally do it outside because it stinks. Today I will blow fans and get all the smell out but today for our purposes it's going to be easier to work on here. You're going to have, their tools are lighter fluid which the boys were very excited to find out about that. They thought my, my two oldest children thought I was going to do something exciting with it, and they found out it wasn't as exciting as they thought it was going to be. Um, make sure you have a surface that is thick enough that won't ruin anything else. So this is two really thick pieces of paper that I'm going to do all this on, and then later I'll throw the paper away. You're going to want to have gloves, and I'm just using a regular piece of tracing paper doesn't matter too much what brand it is as long as it's going to be a, a good quality. And then you're going to put your gloves on and leave them on until this whole process is done. And you're going to use a graphite stick. And you can buy different ones. The one I use is a 6B. That's the, the the thickness, and the, not the thickness, but the um, um, quality of it, because you want it to be hard. You don't want to mix graphite with the idea of charcoal stick. Charcoal stick you'll find in the, in the art stores, and charcoal will just powder up and mess all over, and it won't do this. It's got to be a graphite stick. So there's a graphite stick like that, and then I also found another variety. It's, in a, it's a Lycra brand, L Y. R-A, Lyra, and it's also a 6B, and it's in a stick form that's in a little more round, so you can find them different ways, but just make sure that they are 6B graphite. Then, what you're going to do, and it's going to take some time, is you're going to take the whole sheet and blacken it, the reason you're using gloves. Graphite is not real good for you to put into your skin, so it's best to do this. What I do is I go one way. It's a little bit tricky not to tear your paper, so it takes a little bit of practice. And I actually mix these two brands. It's kind of a recipe. It just works. I, I find all of them work, anything of a 6B graphite, but I've found that mixing doesn't hurt. Maybe it's just because it's more fun. And I go both directions, so I really continue the whole sheet. 
Now, I'm going to have you pretend with me because I'm not going to have you watch me all day doing this. So pretend the entire sheet is blackened. And instead we're just doing that section. Then set these aside. And of course you are outside, not inside. You take a little bit of your um, paper towel, lighter fluid, and what it is is it's going to emulsify the graphite down into the sheet so that when you use it, it's not as powdery. Because if I were to use this now, it would work, but it's real messy and it won't last as long. So you just need a little bit of your lighter fluid. I get a little bit of it off. And you kind of nudge, touch it. If you rub it real hard, you can pull it all the way off. And then you've lost your graphite. And you can see it moves around. I mean, you, as you do it, it will emulsify smooth. Even though I went both directions, look how black and dark that is. Now, if you like lighter paper, see here, if you put less graphite or you move it, you can get different grades of um, the darkness. And that's what I like about making my own because I actually like, there's sometimes I want a dark line and sometimes I want a very light line. So I have a bag of a number of these that will give me the different values of the, of the paper. Then that's already, oops, it didn't dry, see that? Good thing to show you. Until it's dry, you don't want to touch it. It will dry in about 10 minutes and then it's ready to use. Once it's ready to use, it will smear a little bit once in a while perhaps, but if you just fold it over like this, keep it in a baggie, it will last you time after time after time. Now here's something I want you to be sure for, again, of safety, is once you're finished with your whole sheet and you've maybe made yourself a couple extras, always put this away where it goes, and then this is lighter fluid. And we don't want to get it on our hands, and we really don't want to put it under the kitchen sink. It can be a self combustible item and we just really don't want to do that. So what I do is I hold it in my hand and I roll it off and then I grab this one and I roll it off and then I put that out in the garbage can with the sheet underneath it and make sure that um, it's disposed of properly. Then all you have to do is, you know, this is our wet one so we'll use this one like I showed you before. You just lay it under this, you trace down, you pull this all off, you've got your tracing all done, and you're ready to paint. I hope you've enjoyed um, learning about the watercolor paper, stretching it, and a little bit of the properties of that. And then I think you'll find that this carbon paper works really well. Um, look at my website, www.amanarts.com, and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much.